is Dr. Shannon Foster and Julie Danley. Hi. We're here at the McWayne Science Center and our tour is going to begin. Let's see, it's not great. There we go. There's the entrance to the Science Center. Let's go have some fun. So we are on the outside of the McWayne Center. We're in downtown Birmingham. And this very interesting piece of art also utilizes solar energy and can be controlled by these panels down here on the sidewalk. So if you come to the Science Center, be sure and look for this. And it does power some of the things within the building. This is the ball machine that's in the lobby of the McWayne Center. There's also a small replica of the Vulcan. Vulcan is a very famous statue that's here in Birmingham, if you're not from the Birmingham area. Uh, many children and adults alike are fascinated by this, by this ball exhibit. We are going to start by just taking a quick view of the children's area of the museum in case you have children and you'd like to visit here. This is called Just My Size and it has a lot of interesting things for children, things to play with, things to touch, and it's great because they can touch everything that they see. Um, and it does give them an overview of how the rest of the museum is. We're gonna walk through the rest of it now, but we will be focusing on some environmental things. This particular exhibit talks about a fountain and the um, pressures that fountains exhibit. Also talking about geysers and um, water, air and water pressure. Um, there are other exhibits here that talk about steam. We're just going to walk over there and take a look at this steam exhibit. So these are just a few of the very fun exhibits that you can see when we come to the McWing. Wingless cockroach. It makes its home on jungle floors in Madagascar. It's an island off the coast of Africa. These hissing cockroaches are not pests and uh, do not inhabit human dwellings. They get their name from their ability to be able to hiss when they're disturbed. But the connection to Alabama um, in the southeast is that we are home to a number of cockroach species. Most of them are the German, the brown bandit, the smoky brown. Um, despite their reputation, less than 1% of the 4,000 species of cockroaches on earth are considered household pests. And most of them are um, detrivores and they consume decomposing organic matter, which is an important part of all the ecosystems. Um, Chilean rose tarantula. Um, they are natives to the deserts and the scrub regions of Chile and Bolivia and Argentina. And these arachnids live um, and mostly feed on insects and sur can survive many months without eating anything. And since they are nocturnal, um, they remain motionless for most of the day, uh, daylight hours. And like all tarantulas, Chilean red tarantulas are able to deter predators by flicking barbs or um, their hairs from their abdomen, and the hairs can irritate your skin and eyes. So we don't touch her at the museum. Um, these are relatives, the Alabama connection is, these are, uh, there are no relatives to tarantulas in Alabama, but the large wolf spiders here are often mistaken for tarantulas. They can, um, grow up to the size of your hand, the wolf spiders can, and they are beneficial because they eat a variety of pests and can be found in barns all over the southeastern United States. And this is a really interesting uh, one of our exhibits here. And This one is the um, fire ant nests, and these are aluminum casts that you're looking at. Um, if you look up at the top, you'll see a, um, it's to represent like out by your mailbox where you might have an, a fire ant mount. And so this is showing you what's under the ground. These casts are like cities. Um, these are made from aluminum. So um, they actually poured the aluminum down into the anthill, the mound. And this is what is under the ground. These can be the, the largest one I believe that's ever been found was um, 
50 feet into the ground. Um, and the interesting thing about fire ants, and if you live in the southeastern United States, you're familiar with this particular ant. They are not a native species. They actually came to the United States on um, the ballast of the boats coming from South America during the 1930s. Um, and they would dock, they docked in Mobile Bay, and the ants, the dirt, of course, was removed from the ballast. And then, of course, the ants were in the dirt and they started migrating. So they become a really, really pro a real problem in the United States. Um, I believe now since the 1930s they've migrated all the way to Texas and as far north as um, Kentucky. This is a really interesting exhibit. This is um, an exhibit about de decomposition and uh, that shows that organisms feed on decomposing carcasses are called detrivores and they get their energy from the rotting flesh just as we get energy from the food we eat. So on this particular exhibit, um, these are time-lapse videos of animals actually being decomposed. And so you have your choice between a sparrow or a mouse, and you can choose. And then of course you see all of the insects that come in and are the decomposers, like we were talking about earlier, the cockroaches um, are one of those particular species that do the decomposition. Um, and as you can see, you talk about dust to dust, and that's exactly what happens. These animals completely uh, consume the bodies of these other animals and take the energy from them. One of the cool things that we've done here at McWayne is not only can you look at this exhibit, but we actually have an exhibit, a decomposition chamber. Um, this one was started last um, June. So on June 19th, uh, we placed a mud turtle that had, de uh, had died in our aquarium downstairs. And this is, um, so we've been able to watch the decomposition live uh, in the chamber, so it's been really, really interesting. And there's some stages to decomposition. You've probably seen it on roadkill, um, if you've ever looked at it along the side of the road. But the first is called the um, fresh stage, and then the bloat stage. This is the decay stage that we're, you're looking at right now, and then eventually it'll be the dry stage, which that is when most of the scavengers and larvae have left the carcasses, and there's very little flesh left, and most everything has gone back into the soil. And this is our Discovering Alabama uh, exhibit. Um, we have a um, television show here called Discovering Alabama that plays on um, Alabama Public Television and it's hosted by Dr. Doug Phillips, and he uh, is the person who um, also is the narrator for all of these um, particular videos. So you can come up and choose any of the things that you would like to learn about in Alabama. And today we're gonna learn about the Wetumpka Impact Crater, and this is um, goes all the way back to the dinosaurs. So you will choose that, and then on the screen, we'll watch our video. Some say it was Alabama's greatest catastrophe. Experts believe the scope of destruction was so great that if it happened today, nearby Montgomery would be destroyed, as well as Auburn to the east, and Clinton to the west, and perhaps even Birmingham well to the north. I'm standing on the edge of a crater that extends about four miles across and around the Alabama landscape. But what caused such a crater? Many scientists believe that this crater, known as the Wetumpka Impact Crater, was caused by a massive disk from outer space. Along the steep hills of Wetumpka, visitors can easily collect mica, quartz, sandstone. But wait a minute. Here along the fall line, in this part of the state, you wouldn't expect to find this sort of steep hill country, much less metamorphic rocks. Well, geologists are always curious when something is out of the ordinary. And back in the early part of the 1970s, when my colleagues and I were mapping the East Central part of Alabama, and we started getting closer to Wetumpka, and we started seeing hills. The more we saw, the more we put on the maps, the more you realize, hey, this is starting to be a round structure. The rocks that we have brought up from below the surface here are very unusual. And shattered, shattered at great depth. And these shattered rocks are 
strong indication that there was the release of a tremendous amount of energy as in the instance of an asteroid impact. And impact crater. Many scientists now believe that an asteroid, a rather large asteroid, slammed into the planet right here in the heart of Alabama. This is the Alabama Ancient Oceans exhibit, and since we just watched the video about the Wetumpka Crater, um, I thought that this would be a good place to visit. Um, 80 million years ago, um, parts of most parts of Alabama were underwater, and um, this is the exhibit where you can see some of the animals that actually lived during that time period. Um, all the way up through to Birmingham was part of the ocean. And some of these ancient ocean animals were um, just amazing. I mean, we have uh, some of the largest tortoises, uh, some of the largest fish. There are fossils that are found in Alabama still to this day. Um, in fact, um, in a few minutes we'll see uh, one of the new dinosaur species that was actually found in Montgomery County last year. These are the massasaurs. These were like the predecessors to crocodiles and alligators. Um, these particular animals um, can grow up to uh, 11 feet. And um, this particular one was found, this particular fossil was found in Montgomery County, which is just south, or Green County, which is just south of Birmingham. up to be 17 feet in long. Um, these particular um, fossils, this is a model of a fossil that was actually found. And these fossils, I mean, these um, animals were found uh, it's near Mobile Bay, in that area. They were a little bit more deep water fish. These are the cephalopods, and you can see the fossils. Um, of course, these animals, the nautilus is still an animal that we find in our deep oceans today, along with squids. <coughs> history of our of our of our country and of North America. Um, I was reading about the way in which um, all of these creatures, some of the land creatures that we'll actually see in just a few minutes, um, how they actually came to Alabama or this particular area of um, the world. And actually they came across on land bridges that were formed um, before the continent split apart. So some of the species that we find here in Alabama are also found in Asia.
this is Alabama's newest dinosaur. Um, the over 80 million years ago, this dinosaur was um, roaming Montgomery County, which is about an hour south of Birmingham. This dinosaur was discovered by a group of paleontologists. One of the resident paleontologists here at McQueen Center was on that particular dig. And he's been very uh, instrumental in finding out and uh, classifying this particular animal. Um, it was discovered in 2007, but the naming of this particular animal happened last year because it is a new genus and species. It belongs to the Duckbill family. It's just fascinating. Now, Julie, tell us what we're looking at here. What room are we looking at here? This is the paleontology for you take it. We're looking at the paleontology lab. This is where some of um, the scientists that come to work here, um, they also clean the collections here. A lot of um, specimens will be given to McWayne or found, and then um, they are brought here to be preserved and then, of course, go on to display or will go into our collection. We have the largest collection in the southeastern United States. You can see here are catalog shelves, and each one of those um, moves apart. And uh, right now, um, McQueen is working on getting those actually put on digital so that they'll be available to um, everyone in the world. So that's one of their big projects right now is, class, is making sure that each one is photographed and then put onto the website. So if you go onto the McWayne website right now and follow the links to the collections, you can see some of the specimens that we do have in our collection. So this is actually a working lab inside here. Yes. Yes, we have scientists from all over the world that come here to study uh, particular specimens that we might have in the collection. Um, an interesting thing that um, our collections director was telling us um, not too long ago was that all of the species of dinosaur that are going to be discovered from this point forward in the United States will be discovered uh, from the um, eastern side of the Mississippi because of the way in which the, um, the layers of soil were, that every all of the dinosaurs that will be discovered from this point forward will only come from this particular area. So I thought it was super interesting that this will, it's only going to get more exciting for people in Alabama. And if you are interested in dinosaurs, there are local uh, clubs and groups that go out and look for dinosaurs. It's very organized, but it would be a very fun excursion for you and your family if you choose to do that. Um, one thing I find really fun in this museum is that not only do we get to see the lab, but we also um, get a, to a place where we can go um, and touch things. Yes. And so that's what this section is. There are all types of things that we can actually look at here really closely. Um, there are some are replicas and some um, are the actual item where we can actually touch them. And yeah. of course we all know we like to touch things just like uh, our children. So these are really interesting because fossils. we can actually pick up these fossils and take a look at them. Of course, these are some wildlife. So this is a really interesting section of the museum, um, just because there's so many hands-on things that you can do in here. And it doesn't matter what age you are, you can still pick up all of these things and study them. If you have a particular interest, you can find an area that's very interesting to you. Okay, this is another one of the um dinosaur fossils that we have displayed here in, um, in McWayne Center and um, the interesting thing, this was a dinosaur that would have been um, roaming the Appalachian Mountains which go through Kentucky and Tennessee, um, Southern Virginia into uh, Northern Alabama to Central Alabama. And the interesting thing about the Appalachian Mountains, I was telling you a few minutes ago about that the um, that the some of the animals that we find here, ancient animals, are also found in Asia.
because um, they were able to cross land bridges when the continents were still connected. Once the continents separated, um, the glaciers from the north pushed through the Appalachian Mountains and caused the mountains to actually um, split the particular territory in half as the mountains rose. And the parts of um, Alabama actually became temperate rainforests for a while. And that's why we have so much biodiversity here in the state of Alabama to this day. So I guess we can say that dinosaurs were a good thing for Alabama. The particular exhibit is called the Birds of Alabama. And um, what it displays is all the animals that, some of the animals, not all the species of birds that are um, indigenous to Alabama, but these are most of the species that you would, might find in your local neighborhood. So what we have is the year-round animals, animals that live here year-round, and then we also have the summer animals, and those are the animals that migrate to Alabama. And these year-round animals are, um, these are actual, uh, you know, taxidermy specimens, and then what we have is um, underneath, on the bottom of the exhibit, we have information cards and then buttons where you can actually listen to the animal. So for instance, let's see, you have, let's do the Northern Cardinal, because that's an animal that lives in lots of states. But it will give you the information about the animal, when you would likely to see it, of course year round here, where to see one, and um, did you know, and this one is the male cardinal fiercely defends its breeding territory from other males. When a male sees its reflection in the glass surfaces, it frequently will spend hours fighting the imaginary intruder. But what this green button does is once I push it, it will give you the bird call for the northern cardinal. So you can go around and so if you're interested in um, learning more about birds and birds that inhabit your backyard, this would be a great place to, um, to look. We also have birds that winter here in Alabama, of course, that come here during um, the cold when it's cold up north. Um, so these particular animals are here um, during the winter months. So for example, like the winter wren. And this is a really tiny little bird that um, I'm not even sure where he comes from. But anyway, this would be his call. Oh, so but of course, they come to Alabama for because of the temperate zone that we live in. And the temperature never really gets below freezing, but for a few days a year. One time, the um, Audubon Society actually was housed here at the museum. Uh, now they have their own place, but the, these were exhibits that um, they donated to us when they uh, left the museum. This is, of course, our national bird. This is a bald eagle, and we actually have nesting and mating pairs that live in the state of Alabama. Um, we have, I know, a nesting pair that live on Lake Gunnersville. And the interesting thing about the, the bald eagle is that their nests can be... Uh, so, um, the nest can be up to, um, I believe it's 20 feet in diameter and 8 feet deep. Um, and the nesting pair will come back to the same nest every year and add to it wild turkey and of course these are indigenous to the state of Alabama. Um, during the fall and early winter um, we have them all over the state. Um, they are large birds that can stand up to three to four feet. This is of course is a male. The females are solid brown with no plumage. Uh, the females are called hens wild turkey and of course these are indigenous to the state of Alabama. Um, during the fall and early winter um, we have them all over the state. 
um, they are large birds that can stand up to three to four feet. This is, of course is a male. The females are solid brown with no plumage. Uh, the females are called hens. These are the ivory-billed woodpeckers, and there's kind of a story behind these guys. Um, they were thought to be extinct, and then they started seeing sightings of them in um, Arkansas and around the southeastern United States. And at one point, there was actually a reward for a sighting of this bird. Um, scientists believe that they had been extinct, and now they think that they have seen some um, sightings of them all over the southeastern United States. These two birds were collected sometime during the late 20s, um, but they believe that they, the last ones were, uh, they think they became extinct sometime around the 1960s. But now, there is a reward. Um, so if you think you have spotted one of these woodpeckers, then you can get up to a fifty thousand dollar reward for it. <laughs> so you might want to go yeah. bird watching. <laughs> yeah. One of the amazing things about Alabama is our amazing watersheds, and of course those were also formed by the Appalachian Mountains rising um, about seventy uh, million years ago. Um, Alabama has uh, more than seventy thousand uh, miles of waterways throughout the state. Um, one of our largest rivers runs through um, Birmingham area, which is the Cahaba River. Um, the biodiversity, of course, is dependent upon these rivers, and just the um, amazing things that we have available in Alabama, too. It's not just our wildlife, but also our way of life here is based upon this river. Uh, most of our drinking water comes from these rivers, um, so it's super important for us to um, understand and know about them. That's why McWayne has dedicated, um, you know, one part of the museum's aquarium specifically to the Alabama rivers. So let's take a look inside. Okay. These are um, pictures of things that you might actually find in Alabama rivers. Now this particular, um, this is a model, of course, and it's blown up to be many, many, many times of, um, but this is to be a dragonfly larva, and um, this is a great time actually. Uh, we're going to go on, a, I believe, a field trip to um, a river. Um, well, but this particular um, animal, dragonflies lay their eggs on riverbanks, and this is what a dragonfly larva looks like once the eggs hatch. So when we go on our field trip, we'll be looking for some of these. Um, this particular, um, one of the really interesting things about Alabama's river is that we have the largest mussel species uh, and diversity in the United States. Um, some of the species of mussels are not found anywhere else in the world. Um, and of course, mussels are super, super important. Which means that they actually help filter the fresh water. So they're very, very important to the ecosystems and the, um, they assure that we have healthy uh, freshwater lakes and rivers. Um, this is also an animal that you might find along your um, walk if you're out in a near riverbank or stream bed. Um, this is a salamander. Uh, we have different species of salamanders in Alabama. This is a red spotted salamander. Um, the salamander is an interesting animal because we call them bioindicators. Um, they are, because their skin is so sensitive, they breathe through their skin. They, while they do have lungs, their skin absorbs oxygen through the water, which lets you know if you have, don't have a lot of salamanders, then your water is probably not very healthy. So, like frogs and um, other amphibians, we consider salamanders to be super important um, to the health of a tree. Now, this 
is a really interesting part of the exhibit. This is about the Cahaba River. And at one point, not too long ago, the Cahaba River was not in great shape. It is the home of the famous Cahaba lily. It's one of the few places in the world where this particular lily is found. Um, now it's actually been discovered in different parts of Asia, but of course, again, because species once were able to, um, <coughs> were connected to About 10, 15 years ago, I guess it was, the Cahaba River was um, considered a um, super fun site. And a group of citizens of Alabama got together and started um, cleaning up the river. This actually came out of the river. Drinking water actually comes out of this river in Birmingham. So I'm not sure that you would want to drink water where this is floating around. This is our um, natural tank. This is our river tank. And in here we have different species. We have species like the bluegill, or the yellow perch. Um, we have some different types of bass. We also we have a spotted bass. We have um, the black buffalo fish. All of these are freshwater fish. And we have two really big blue catfish. I don't know if we can see them. I'll get them over here. And of course, we have some of our turtles. <laughs> They're following us. Yeah. I think yes. they like the camera. I do too. <clears throat> but as you can see, this is a model. Um, these guys live in a tank that is a model of what the bottom of the top would look like. So you see all the mussel shells. Oh, here are the catfish over here. <coughs> and the alligator bar. So our two big blue catfish. You can see those guys. I'll turn around. The blue catfish, um, They only like like really clear water. And those are some alligator guards that you see up there. And they, the uh, catfish prefer clear water. So of course they want to live in healthy water. These guys eat fish and crayfish, mussels and frogs. Aren't they beautiful? And of course, catfish get their name because of their whiskers. <clears throat> this guy is an alligator gar. He is actually one of the fish that is a relative from prehis prehistoric fish. He li usually lives near vegetation, and they are strong predators, and their favorite food is crayfish. There's a turtle over here on the rock.
is a red eared slider down here, and you can tell by the fact that he has red ears. It's a very common pond turtle or river turtle in uh, North America. And he's really a snapping turtle. I mean, he really um, okay, this is the exhibit where, for the cypress forest. And cypress trees are especially adapted to grow in wet places. And in southern Alabama, near the Gulf Coast, we actually have brackish waters where cypress trees grow um, along the delta. Um, and the rivers usually flow, all the rivers flow. This is where the rivers meet the Gulf Coast. And um, some of the species inside of our cypress tank include the large alligator snapping turtle. I think he likes the camera. <laughs> Look at him. Look at him. He is stretching to get his face uh -huh. in this camera. <laughs> oh, he's moving. He's coming towards us. Yeah. Of course, they eat small fish. He definitely knows you're filming. <laughs> he doesn't usually move this quickly. His jaws are super powerful. Like you definitely would not want to be bitten by him. Here he comes, really close to us. <laughs> Thankfully, there's glass between uh, my fingers and his mouth. <laughs> And these guys are an important part of the food chain. You know, while we, um, they are a predator in this particular, one of the top predators in this particular um, ecosystem. <clears throat> but without that predator, then we would have probably too many of these brim that are swimming around. Uh, I think he is fascinated by that camera. Look at him. Isn't that funny? That was hilarious. We're going to get a look at his mouth. Oh, there he is. He's looking at us. <laughs> he is going to get as close as possible. You know, a lot of people ask the difference between a turtle and a tortoise. And this is a really good example. You can see that his shell is relatively flat and that he has webbed claws. <clears throat> Turtles um, live in the water and tortoises, of course, live on land. And their shells are more dome-shaped than flat. Of course, it makes him more aerodynamic. Not that he's really a fast moving guy. <laughs> he loves that. Oh, well, I guess I we have to take see a him. bite to him. I think can see Maybe he sees himself in there. And he thinks there's another snapping turtle. The reflection at the back of the apple. That's possible. Like in the same, so. <laughs>
Oh, he said that's it. Okay, bye folks. Look at that tail. Oh, and he's swimming. There he goes. Okay, this is the McWayne Science Center touch tank. And in the touch tank, we have two types of stingray and three types of sharks. Um, the stingrays that you're looking at, um, that is a southern ray. And then we have the cow nose ray, of course, because of this cow nose. Um, both of these particular species are um, indigenous to the Gulf of Mexico. So if you ever visit the beach along the Gulf Coast, you might actually see a school of these particular animals. These two different, um, <clears throat> all of the stingrays in the um, tank are male because the females grow to be six feet in diameter. Of course, these guys are all full grown and they swim in big giant schools. This guy swimming around here, wanting to get our attention. <clears throat> that is a bonnet head shark. They're also very prolific in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they are the smallest of the hammerhead genus. So they're cousins to the hammerhead shark. This guy's also cool brown. Who's this little guy over here? <clears throat> that is a um, bamboo reef shark. That's an albino bamboo reef shark. That shark was actually born here at the museum. Um, they, um, they are not indigenous to <laughs> the Gulf of Mexico. They are actually can be found um, along the uh, coast of Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Um, and the other one is an apple shark. Those um, are not her eyes on her back. Those actually are part of her camouflage. If predators were swimming up above, they would think that she's a much larger animal than she is and would not attack. So in the McWayne Center, children can come up to this tank and actually touch sure. the animals. Two fingers along the back as they swim by. Let's see if we can get them to come to me. So the great thing about the McWayne Center is that there are a lot of hands-on items both exhibits and these live exhibits so that not only children but adults as well um, can connect with, with our environment and with the animals that live in our environment. Okay, this is one of the exhibits that we have here in the aquarium. Um, this was actually taken from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, it is a seafood watch and this is a way chart about things that we can make a difference in the health of our oceans by choices that we make at the grocery store and restaurants. So this is the best choices, good alternatives, and things to avoid. And they take into account things like how it's farmed, or if it's a wild caught, how is it caught, where does it come from. Um, and these are really important things. Of course, um, Alabama being along the Gulf Coast, um, fishing is one of the um, largest industries along the um, Gulf in our region. So for those of you that don't live in a Gulf state, um, this may be a new, new thing for you. Um, but we really have to start thinking about um, alternatives to uh, wild caught fish only because um, our ecosystem, some of the fish are in short supply and So we're always looking for better choices and best choices. Um, sharks are an important part of our ocean and we want people to understand that. Of course, we have lots of sharks in the Alabama Gulf Coast region. So um, these 
sharks travel from the Gulf Coast along the eastern seaboard during the winter times, uh, or during the summer times, um, and of course you hear about the shark attacks along the North Carolina and South Carolina areas, um, all the way up into New York and along New Jersey. But um, we take into we take the shark population very seriously because um, these sharks. But hopefully all of you have done your assignment on should we save the sharks after reading the article on, on sharks and making your decisions about what we should do about saving the sharks that are being harvested for shark fin soup. Well, class, that completes our field trip for the McWayne Center. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you'll come and see the McWayne Center in person. And if you'll complete your assignment that I have uploaded for you, um, I hope that you've learned a lot about Alabama and about the McWayne Center. Thanks.